All right, welcome everybody. I think we're going to get started now. Um, thank you all. I want to welcome you. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. So, uh, appreciate you guys joining us. This is our second this year of a program that the AI of Kansas City and the Builders Association of Kansas City have started called AEC Insights. Earlier this year, we did one uh, about working uh, with the COVID pandemic on job sites shortly after the pandemic broke out in March. And this has been something that we've wanted to start and continue a relationship between AI Kansas City and the Builders Association to provide content that is relevant for architects, contractors, and engineers about ongoing issues in our industry, profession, and our region. And as we were, as our planning team of Builders Association and AI Kansas City was discussing what we would like to do next, still yet this year, we felt that it was important to address what is the future economic situation look like, what has COVID done, and what does it look like going into the, the upcoming year. So we've got some uh, esteemed guests uh, that we'll be presenting to you in a moment. But first, I would like to introduce Don Taylor, Executive Director of AI Kansas City, and Don Greenwell, President of the Builders Association, to uh, welcome us. Good morning, I'm Dawn Taylor, and thank you so much for getting up to, uh, to join us this morning. I was especially excited to see uh, so many registrations from other AIA chapters around the country, um, other communities outside of Kansas City. I mean, clearly you saw the, the value in hearing the expertise of our two guest speakers today. And certainly as I uh, get ready to introduce Michelle Russo, uh, I, I wanna tell you, you're in for a real treat. You're in for some great note-taking. I hope you're ready to absorb all that they have to offer. Um, I've heard Michelle speak several times at national AIA gatherings and I just jumped at the chance uh, for our chapter to link up with Don Greenwell and his group uh, to, to bring her expertise to the table along with Ken. So without further ado, let me introduce Michelle. She is the Managing Director of Research and Practice at American Institute of Architects based in Washington, DC. She's responsible for advancing architectural research and practice prosperity, providing insights and disruptive trends and overseeing AIA's business uh, intelligence and economic work. Michelle previously worked for Dodge Data and Analytics, where she ran its Smart Market Research Program, providing data and intelligence on AEC industry trends, most notably sustainable design and construction. Michelle has a degree in chemical engineering from Cornell, as well as a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Don Greenwell for his introduction. Thank you, Don, and good morning. Thank you, Ryan, for getting us kicked off. Uh, we've got another great AEC Insights series for today. We've been very excited uh, through our membership and our collaboration with the design community in our uh, common community of practice in our region. So let me introduce Ken Simonson. Ken's been the chief economist for the National Association of General Contractors of America for nearly 20 years. Uh, he's also had over 40 years of experience in the field. He's frequently interviewed by the media locally and nationally, uh, presents uh, throughout the country and has over 50,000 subscribers to his weekly daily digest uh, e-newsletter. He currently serves as a liaison to the Census Bureau's Construction Data Modernization Workgroup. He is a fellow and past president of the National Association of Business Economic, uh, Economists and he's a co-director of the Tax Economist uh, uh, forum, which is a meeting group that he helped co-found, I believe, in uh, the early 1980s. Ken has a BA in economics from the University of Chicago, as well as a master's uh, of arts in economics from the Northwest University. Thank you, Ken, for being with us today. And Ryan, let's roll. Thank you very much. So just to remind everyone the format. So uh, we are gonna have Michelle and Ken each give a uh, brief presentation uh, in their specialties. Uh, they've got PowerPoint slides and some things to discuss uh, to help us understand more of what the economy and what the forecast looks like. Then we are gonna open it up for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please use the chat 
and send those to us and then we will get to those uh, at the at the completion of their presentations. So we are going to start with Michelle and ask her to begin her sharing her presentation. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I, I appreciate the warm introduction uh, from Don and Don and Ryan. Uh, and of course, it's always great to join Ken uh, for a program. I've known him for a number of years. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about things from the architect's kind of lens, and then we'll pass it off to Ken. There's a few things that I kind of have in here that he digs in a little bit deeper on, and I'll note those as we go through. Um, so I think this is on everybody's mind, what's sort of coming out of the election. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we've, now that we sort of know who the, the president-elect is, uh, it gives us the ability to hone a little bit more on what we might expect uh, coming out of the new administration. Uh, major areas of focus um, for President-elect Biden are in fiscal stimulus area, taxes, regulation, climate change, immigration policy, and health care, right, is the quick list. Um, but the differences from how that might change is some rollbacks of the tax bill if there's support in, in Congress to do that. Um, regulation and climate change is certainly obviously um, a key initiative for the Democratic Party, um, but also connecting that into um, the economic piece of it. And you can see some of the advisors that have been named um, kind of are looking at climate from an international partnerships perspective. Um, versus some other approaches to climate change. Um, immigration policy, I know Ken will touch on that as it relates to the construction workforce. Um, and of course, this is um, continued support for healthcare and of course, a lot of focus on the pandemic in the early stages of the administration. Um, other, there are some areas, but we, we know that this will be a likely a divided Congress, if not very slim, slim majority in the Senate. Um, where the vice president would be breaking the tie, um, which means there will be some moderation in some of the policies that are proposed and move forward. Um, so there are, so looking at those areas of agreement are important um, for us in terms of our expectation. Um, we do expect, and so those two areas of agreement are in infrastructure funding. Um, this was talked about uh, during the early, the, during, during the 2015 election, 2016, um, but had other priorities that came out of the Trump administration versus this investment. So we do think this is an area of bipartisan agreement, um, as well as trade. There actually is some more agreement in that area than you might think. Um, the implications for the construction outlook, um, kind of going to talk about housing and non-residential on the housing side. Um, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party is pretty focused on foreclosure moratoriums and that mortgage interest local property tax deduction um, it being also an important aspect of that, uh, and the secondary mortgage market reform as well. On the non-residential side, again, I alluded to that infrastructure spending being a bipartisan support area. I think Ken's going to touch a little more on the employment stuff, so I'll sort of defer, defer in those to that or in the Q&A section. So coming off the election, what are some things that can happen in Congress? There's been, we do know there's a bill that may pass in the lame duck, in the lame duck um, uh, part of the Congress. Um, and it's a moderate uh, proposal put forth by moderate parts, the moderate members of both parties in the Senate and seems to have leadership agreement on the Democratic side. So we will see there is a plan put forth by McConnell that has um, on the Republican side that has a sliced down version of this. But um, the money is mostly going into local state governments. Um, there's some unemployment protection. So but extending federal unemployment benefits in dollars as well. Um, and it's uh, under, 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 um, it's not at the amount that the that that are kind of in these numbers. So is that sort of 500 billion less, certainly less than a trillion dollars that they're talking about infusing in. Um, and so this is a Kermit Baker, who's our chief economist who I work with closely, um, kind of did an analysis of, of the S&P Global Ratings and Deutsche Bank. And 
um, sort of looked at what this would mean in terms of the federal dollars coming in to support economic expansion broadly and how that might sort of re return the economy broadly. Um, and you can see sort of depending on the infusion of funds um, is sort of when we'll see a turnaround, I think. In general, um, if things go as they are, it's obviously a very positive sign, the vaccine progress and that starting to take form the end of this year and into early next year um, to sort of stave off some of the um, alarming uh, results from, from the pandemic and the, and the COVID virus. Um, but then we're looking at a 2022 um, kind of return to expansion part. So I'm going to go into some economic indicators to start. Again, I know Ken has um, has some a lot of information kind of on payroll, and so I'll, I'll sort of punt some of those. But you know, you can see that there is recovery in some sectors, and I'm going to dig in a little bit there, um, but not so in others. And so I think this is the story on the architect side about. Um, you know, most, most of our members, most architects do work in the non-residential marketplace, but you can see in that housing starts number um, that, that this, is, this is actually a good market. We're seeing growth amongst, very strong growth um, in housing starts nationally, um, that basically back to what it was like at the beginning of the year. Our members um, are also reporting growth um, since that dip down in April. Um, in terms of design contracts and billing. So both are skyrocketing, haven't been higher in the last few years. So, um, you know, for on the architect side, the, their clients tend to be in custom residential work. Um, these are the people who are have not been laid off at the same numbers. They're the people working at home. They're looking around their rooms, their houses, um, and wanting to do improvements. So we've, we've seen architects extremely busy, which is in stark contrast to the rest of the marketplace. Um, another one I wanna show sort of that kind of winners and losers piece is in the retail sales. So you can see those have also rebounded and um, we haven't seen the November numbers, but expect those to be relatively consistent with October. Um, but the winners there are certainly bifurcated, right? And, and the big one is those that are in e-commerce. Um, and we're starting to even see um, with the cases increase, there's now sort of relationships between UPS and real retailers on the ability to, to deliver at the pace that they've been orders in. There's been some revision to these numbers. So actually Q2, Q2 um, is about 16.1%, but you can still see we were on this sort of standard linear sort of trajectory and it just broke all records coming out of how much re retail revenue is coming through e-commerce. So again, sort of changing the landscape as it affects our businesses um, because it's not it's not the same retail market um, that it was prior to the pandemic. Um, I want to kind of shift a little bit into what we're going to see from what it's like to be employed um, within the profession specifically. Um, you know, we know architects and contractors look a little different in terms of their workplaces. Um, generally across the United States, um, a third of companies expect a pretty large portion, four in 10 of their employees to be primarily virtual um, uh, through, through the pandemic into 2022. Um, but, but you can kind of see how stark that is from where from where that that movement was. And we'd started to hear obviously about remote working, a lot of technology to enable that, but it really hadn't taken hold um, too substantially. That you know, still three quarters of the workforce was, you know, um, be, uh, or uh, um, of employees were were really not working at home that much. Um, and now that's kind of expanded to sort of invert, right? And and expecting that will stay until until things are clear and also um, and also may have just changed how teams operate. Um, in architecture, as you can imagine, because there's so many small businesses, many of them have reopened. Um, for our really small guys, they never closed, right? They also have home offices and things like that um, and don't need to worry about social distancing if there aren't employees. Um, so, so again, a, a bulk of those firms, about half a kind of are back in. Um, and there's that, so the red is kind of the, you know, or the 2020 piece of it. Uh, but what we're finding from larger firms is that some sort of like partial reopen, um, or are expecting this to come in 2021. And there's still a pretty good share, um, you know, that are kind of uncertain that 12% kind of of where their, their plans are. 
Um, and then a lot of it is, is again, another 13%, the yellow bars that are really waiting to see what happens with, with the vaccine, with um, controlling the pandemic um, before they make any plans. Um, I'm going to shift to construction spending a little bit, um, talk about how it has continued to soften, but it doesn't reflect the magnitude of the downturn. And we'll show a few slides on the architecture billings index that kind of, I think, show that a little more clearly. Um, Ken is going to go into some of these specifically, but um, some areas to highlight for us is um, obviously lodging. Um, and amusement and recreation are hard hit by the pandemic. People aren't traveling, they rely on conference business. That's not happening. Um, so those markets are expected to have, if you look at um, Dodge's five-year forecast, a much, much longer recovery period than the economy or even the larger non-residential um, marketplace. Um, the, the areas of, of growth uh, this year are in healthcare. There was some earlier projects in the year in the commercial space um, also that, have that will be expected to lead to some growth at the end of the year as well. Um, on the employment side, so we lag a little bit. Actually, tomorrow we'll see the, the October numbers for the architecture firm employment side. Um, it's, you know, we obviously had our lowest month in May. Um, in all in all, we've lost 11,000 positions, but it continues to be this, this curve. And we would expect that the November numbers, when we get them back in, in January, will, will show um, that decrease again. So we've heard anecdotally about firms that have done another round of layoffs with the expiration of the PPP and concerns about 2021 revenue. Um, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, our architecture billings index, so basically um, what's interesting about architects, and I like to highlight this, um, Kermit developed an index 25, uh, a little more than 25 years ago with the AIA, and after some tweaking found out that uh, a really simple math on the billings of architects every month was one of the better predictors of where the construction economy was going, um, and so it's been a really important a good tool for us um, to sort of help show that trickle down effect of designers work and how important it is to the, the economy, despite being a relatively small part of the overall workforce, um, you know, at 200,000 at its peak. Um, and this is where you can kind of see how different, how uh, um, dramatic the downturn was. We came from really good economic conditions in the first few months of the year um, to a place we hadn't ever seen before. So we've seen some stabilization, um, but there continues to be a decline. So anything below 50 means bulk of firms are reporting that their billings are going down. Um, ABI is um, it does quite well as a nine to 12 month barometer. So again, if we, um, of the market largely. So if you if you kind of spell that out, we're looking at this um, not kind of go, us not going into recovery, on, you know, till the latter parts of 2021 in our industry. Um, our, our design contracts sort of bumped over that 50 mark. Um, so there is some indication. So that was kind of our attempt to get a little in front of the billings um, to signing new work. And we did see quite a bit of that, uh, that October was a good month um, and people are starting to sign things again. Um, we know that architects, I didn't put the inquiries number up here because it's a little wiggy in terms of its um, predictive abilities, um, but, uh, it has shown throughout that the, the conversations between architects and their clients um, or prospective clients um, have continued through the pandemic and particularly in the fall. So that's a good sign that there are conversations happening um, and, and um, those relationships are existing once um, there is the ability to kind of get financing and move forward with that work. Um, uh, taking the ABI, we break it down into major construction sectors, and I'll show the geographies in a sec. Um, and you can see that um, all of the sectors have weakened with the pandemic, um, but we've seen some recovery in multifamily housing. So you can see that number bumped up in Q3, and uh, obviously Q4 is just one month. Um, and so it's, uh, that's been, a, a again, not as strong as single-family housing, but has been a market that's seen little bit of recovery um, 
and uh, but commercial institutional still quite hard hit um, as well. And we'll, we expect that to continue into 2021 with um, mat mapping somewhat against construction spending. Um, regionally, um, the West has sh is showing kind of the strongest um, right now declines um, with and the the East being the Northeast continuing to be one of the weaker markets um, as it has actually for several years. Um, but this, uh, you know, there's there's winners and losers kind of in this. But the the West continues to see expansion. The early parts of the pandemic, the Midwest, um, the disease hadn't quite spread there yet, um, and it had been pretty strong. And Texas was showing some strength in the South, also in the early before um, the early parts before kind of um, oil prices sank and there was some other factors going on. But again, the spread of the disease has sort of even some of these out. Um, in terms of uh, where the work is, um, we just released AIA's firm survey, so sort of a census of architecture firms. So you can find that um, online because of the, the economic conditions, we've made that broadly available um, for download off of our website. Um, and uh, one of the, the kind of interesting bits, I think, um, and, and this is based on the 2019 data, so we do it every two years, um, is renovation work is a share of architecture billings um, went up pretty notably, right? Almost five points. Um, so almost half of billings now in architects, and we usually see this happen during bad times, right? So that, you know, there's people are, again, revamping, investing in their assets, um, but we didn't see that 2019 was a strong growth for architects and yet their existing building work went through the roof. So um, there's a couple of factors involved in that. And we think a big part is um, environmental, um, you know, the, the desire for owners to, to deal with resilience and climate change impacts and make their buildings better assets um, and serve them better operationally as well. And so have used architects in those rehab and renovation projects. Um, we expect this to, to continue and we'll look for, at 2021, I expect it to be even larger because there's so much need to revamp space due to the pandemic. Um, and also people in these long-term office leases that have, might have changed to um, more of an offsite workforce of their jobs, what do they do with those spaces? And so there's also discussions about that type of work. So um, certainly a lot of conversations going on between architects and their clients in this existing building market space. We expect that to continue. Um, and then, uh, you know, when we when we divide that out, we see institutional is kind of the strongest share of that, so over fifty three percent. But commercial and um, in this and residential as well. So, um, in the commercial side, I think office is where this. So this is where we'll see what those tweaks are and the change um, in twenty twenty one between what's happening this year and next year. Um, institutional, most of that's coming out of school projects. Um, in terms of existing building work. And again, we would expect that to continue to grow. Um, we, on our last ABI, we've been getting a lot of questions about um, difficulty in getting supplies, suppliers and materials um, from the architect lens. And I know Ken will go into pricing and, and some of that in a moment, um, but we wanted to kind of see how architects lens were on these um, issues because we were getting asked it a lot. Um, and then there is pretty much a split opinion. Um, about a third are saying they're seeing some, some limited availability, higher prices, some disruption in the supply chain. Um, there's some, you know, a more another quarter that's sort of more moderate another quarter that's kind of mixed trends. And then there's a portion that says, I really haven't seen any changes. So um, it is a little bit of a mixed bag, but something we're keeping our eye on, um, whether that red piece continues to expand or, or contracts going into the next year and, um, and a return of the, you know, the control of the pandemic, of course a lot is related to. Um, in terms of what they've seen, again, a lot of firms have actually seen impact um, on this. Uh, and those the impacts they've seen is scale backs in some of the scopes. You know, that's also um, not necessarily only about materials. That's also about availability, labor, all sorts of factors that are that are um, putting constraints on the market right now. Um, but increased project budgets, obviously, to account for that. Um, the substitution, so there's some more requests to come in to change some of the specs. 
Um, there have been some projects, some architect firms that have reported some projects put on hold or dropped. Um, and then a little bit on the read, uh, about a third on the redesign side. So there definitely is some traction and some things happening around kind of commodity and firms. I'm going to end with uh, and then pass it off to Ken on revenues. So on the architect side, um, you know, they're they're concerned about 2021 um, across the board. We have about an average of an expectation of 5.5 down. Uh, um, but you can see that's really spread, right? There's there's quite a bit of, of disparity between like what those decreases are. The blue sections are the positive note. We do have about a quarter of our firms that are seeing growth. A lot of those do work in healthcare in particular. Um, when we dig a little bit deeper um, qualitatively into who, who those folks are. Um, and there's another quarter that are expecting to not see those declines, but where we are concerned about the 16% that think their revenue expectation is more than 20%, 20, more than a quarter declining next year. Um, and even that additional 17% is a bit alarming um, if you're looking at reductions between 10 and 24%. So, you know, that's about half of our firms that are, you know, um, expecting declines and some of them very steep. So these are things we're keeping our eye on. We break these apart from a sector perspective. Again, I mentioned um, where some of those growth were. So institutional is lower overall, but again, when we dig in those firms that do healthcare work are also doing a little more positive. Um, but multifamily, just as I talked about earlier with the billing starting to kind of go up and on the positive side there, um, they also are not expecting pretty much flat next year. So this really is a tale of two stories on the architecture side that the residential market seems to be relatively stable or in single family growing, um, but uh, the bigger bulk of the work areas of concern, even in the outlook in 2021. With that, I'm gonna end. We have uh, several resources and we'll make sure this deck gets out, um, but I'm gonna pass it off to Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We'll let, have Ken start his portion now. All right. Well, glad to be with you. And, and I think uh, Michelle did a great job of uh, presenting information that both uh, complements and uh, expands on what I plan to show you. I'm uh, the, uh, as you heard, the chief economist for AGC of America. And we have 88 chapters around the country, including the Builders Association, a heavy uh, chapter in the Kansas City area and then uh, chapters that cover the rest of Missouri and the rest of Kansas. Uh, in total, we have over 27,000 member companies that do every kind of construction other than single family home building. And at AGC of America, we've been fortunate in being able to tap that network this year uh, nine times for surveys focused on the impacts of coronavirus on contractors, their workers, their supply chain, and their expectations. So I wanna start by taking you through some of those survey results and then broaden the lens to talk about what I'm seeing in other government data, other sources like the ABI, and uh, what I think it all portends for construction going forward. Our latest survey was completed October 19th, and we received over a thousand responses, including enough from Missouri that we broke those results out. And uh, those and many other things are on our website, agc.org, specifically agc.org slash coronavirus. And I'll show you that screen at the end. Uh, for me, the most significant and frankly, most alarming result was that 75% of respondents in that October survey said that they'd had a project postponed or canceled. Uh, that percentage was up from an already high 60% of respondents when we asked the same question in August and 32% in June. At the other end of the spectrum, only about 23% of respondents, less than a quarter, said that they had won a new project or an add-on to an existing project. And that percentage has stayed pretty stable, around 20% ever since we started asking in the early spring. So a lot more folks experiencing cancellations and postponements than new work. Uh, another concerning result was that over three quarters of respondents said that they had experienced delays or disruptions just recently. 
I had hoped that the supply chain was getting better, and it was in one respect. At the beginning of the year, uh, there were a huge number of respondents who said they were having trouble getting personal protective equipment, and that was causing delays and disruptions. That problem has almost vanished. Only 7% said that that was an issue as of October. But there was a significant increase in the percentage of respondents who said that problems getting materials, equipment, or parts was causing delays or disruptions, 42% of respondents. And in fact, over half of the respondents mentioned in write-ins uh, different issues with the materials or with the supply chain itself, ports or trucking delays. The uh, percentage who said that a shortage of craft workers, either their own or subcontractor workers, has held steady at a high one third of respondents. Well, with all that going on, it's not surprising that only a third of firms say that business has already returned to year ago levels. And about the same percentage said that uh, it will take more than six months to get that percentage back, uh, get business back to previous levels. This is actually a question that we borrowed from the Census Bureau's weekly small business pulse survey. And in that survey, they do break out construction firms. I'm not sure how many they're uh, getting answers from each week, but the percentage who said it's gonna take more than six months actually rose in November from a pretty steady one third uh, up to about 39% in the mid-November results. Uh, finally, we also ask a question, uh, we do a survey every August, have done this for nine years since we first started hearing about shortages of craft workers. Uh, this year, uh, that survey uh, focused uh, still on workforce, but we did ask some of the same questions uh, from the uh, coronavirus surveys. Significantly, there was a big drop in the percentage of firms who said they were having trouble filling either craft or salaried positions, uh, but it was still more than half the firms said they'd had trouble filling craft positions. We asked about 20 specific crafts, and uh, in contrast to previous years, when nearly every one of those uh, were hard to fill for at least half the firms, this time there wasn't a single position that half the firms said they had trouble filling. For the salaried positions though, 80% of the people who were trying to find a project supervisor or manager said that that position was hard to fill. And that was a big jump from previous years. Well, let me broaden this to go now to what's happened to construction employment throughout the economy. And as Michelle mentioned, we'll be getting the November figures tomorrow and probably a revision on the October numbers. But at any rate, what this shows is that from the recent peak in February, there was a drop of almost 1% in employment in both construction and the overall economy in March. And then employment just fell off a cliff in April. So these lines all dropped by 13 to 15%. The construction recovery began in May uh, in a big way. And there were two reasons for that. First, project owners and governors and mayors who had ordered projects to be halted generally ended those orders by April. And second, the construction industry was very quick at applying for, accept, uh, receiving, and putting uh, to use Paycheck Protection Program loans. In our May survey, 80% of respondents had already made use of those loans to recall workers who had been laid off or to keep people on the payroll. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports on five categories of construction firms. Residential building firms, that would be home builders and general contractors whose main work is in the multifamily area, plus residential specialty trade contractors who may be working on new homes or on renovations and additions. And then non-residential includes general building contractors, specialty trade contractors, and heavy and civil engineering contractors. So I combined the two residential categories to produce the blue line and the three non-residential categories to show you what's happening on the non-res side. Uh, and you can see that by June, the recovery was continuing at a much brisker rate than it was for the overall economy, but 
there was a growing difference between residential and non-residential. And since June, residential employment has continued to grow at a very strong rate of about 1% a month, while non-residential employment actually stalled, was dead flat from June to September. We did have a pickup in October according to preliminary figures, but we'll have to see if that continues. I have my doubts. In the Kansas and Missouri markets, it's a much prettier picture. Uh, specifically, construction employment has uh, rebounded in the Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas sides combined uh, to a record high. For metro areas, we get data uh, only uh, that is not seasonally adjusted. Uh, so it can be misleading to compare across months. And on this slide, I've taken the history of this series for October only. And you can see that the October 2020 figure was the highest ever. In contrast, national construction employment is still below the February level. And that February peak was below the all time high back in 2006. Kansas City Mo has can, is particularly done very well. Uh, in uh, the 2020 October number was actually 12% higher than October of 2019. Kansas City, Kansas was also at a record level, uh, but just up eight tenths of a percent from October of 2019. HEC of America ranks 358 metro areas for which the Bureau of Labor Statistics provides construction employment data. And we put out our October rankings yesterday. Uh, Kansas City Mo came in uh, among the top 10 for both percentage increase and numerical increase in employment. In uh, the most jobs added category, uh, Kansas City, Missouri added 3,700 jobs. That was the third most of any metro area over those 12 months. And in percentage terms, Kansas City, Missouri added 12%, as I said, and that tied for ninth most uh, in the country. And in fact, Springfield, Missouri tied for fourth most uh, with a 16% increase, a 15% increase. That was 1,400 jobs. So uh, Western Kansas is doing extremely well these days. In terms of construction spending, uh, we have uh, a more dismal picture. These figures are available uh, from the Census Bureau on the first business day of each month. They're national only, and uh, they are presented two ways, the raw or not seasonally adjusted number, and then the number that's seasonally adjusted at an annual rate. Before your eyes glaze over, let me explain seasonal adjustment and then uh, Michelle has shown you quite a few seasonally adjusted numbers as were the uh, employment numbers that I showed you. Uh, take into account the fact that you always have uh, differences among the months and some of those differences recur because of holiday or weather or other patterns. Uh, so seasonal adjustment takes several past years uh, to see what the difference is between a given month and the year long average. And then that adjusted number is multiplied by 12. So you can readily compare a given month to uh, previous years. And what we found or what the Census Bureau showed was that the seasonally adjusted October total was almost level with February down just two tenths of a percent. So better than uh, the employment number. Uh, but big differences among categories. First, private residential of a very strong 7%. That's almost 1% a month increase over those eight months with gains in both single and multifamily construction. I think going forward, single family will do even better, although at the moment, uh, builders are constrained by a lot of factors, difficulty finding buildable lots, getting permits and utilities in place, delivery delays and shortages of workers in some cases. Nevertheless, I think single family is headed for even stronger growth. Now, I was encouraged that the architects who work on multifamily <clears throat> seem to be hanging on, uh, that the uh, architecture billings index for multifamily has been positive for, I think, three months now. And the expectation was that uh, revenues would stay about the same next year. But I do think this double-digit increase in multifamily is going to fade. 
Uh, this series measures what we call value put in place or spending on projects already underway. And so many of those multifamily projects, of course, started well before the pandemic hit. And as they finish up, I think the multifamily projects will be smaller, uh, but there will still be quite a few of them happening uh, in smaller metros and suburban areas. In contrast to the strong growth in private residential construction, private non-residential is already down 6%, public construction down 2%. And I think going forward, those things will get worse. Again, as current projects finish up and fewer new projects are coming on board as the AGC surveys have found. Uh, and also the data from Dodge Data and Analytics and Construct Connect on the value of new construction starts has generally been quite negative compared to year ago levels. Well, let me take you through the segments uh, that the Census Bureau breaks out. And I have to warn you that they do have some fairly quirky definitions that date to uh, as far back as the 1960s. And as uh, Don Greenwell mentioned, I am a liaison to Census and trying to get them to modernize some of these data. Uh, the power segment is the biggest, and that's because they combine every type of power generation, whether traditional or renewable, transmission and distribution uh, with oil and gas field construction, the construction that happens around a well, and also pipelines. So you can see both of these categories were down steeply. I think uh, with the, the Biden administration taking office, we'll see an even bigger drop off in uh, construction and uh, direct investment in oil and gas fields and pipelines. And electric, we should see a pickup in wind, both onshore and offshore, and also in things related to power construction, such as uh, battery storage and uh, some types of transmission. Education construction uh, uh, has a big dichotomy between uh, elementary and secondary schools and higher education. The primary and secondary school construction is actually up a little bit. I suspect some of that, uh, more of that is probably uh, renovation and additions to existing schools to allow kids to go back to school with greater spacing, even though many school districts for now have uh, pulled back from putting kids back in the classrooms. Uh, but at any rate, the property tax base uh, has generally held up much better than other tax sources. And uh, school districts, therefore, are in better shape than many other public agencies. In fact, house prices have been rising rapidly. And so once assessors come through and mark up uh, the assessed value of existing homes, tax base should rise even more. On the higher ed side, you've had a huge loss of tuition, student fees, and in some cases, athletic revenue, and also a huge drop in the number of students on campus or even enrolled, uh, particularly from foreign, uh, from international students, but also uh, domestic. And so I think higher ed construction is going to be damaged for quite a long time. Highway and street construction down very steeply, that reflects a little bit uh, the drop in gas tax and diesel tax revenues, vehicle registrations from the spring, those things are bouncing back, but also uh, this is coming off near record levels. I do think that highway and street construction will be down slightly going forward. Commercial is one of those terms that the Census Bureau uses in a unique way. For them, it means retail warehouse and farm construction, and not surprisingly, warehouse is growing, retail down, uh, these trends are certainly going to continue next year. Office is another term that has a hidden component to it. Back in the 60s, there was no such thing as a data center. Instead, a large office building might have had a room with a false floor, special locks, and extra air conditioning to house the mainframe computers. But now you have buildings that basically house nothing but servers and yet they're still included in the office category. And they're the piece that seems to be doing much better. Uh, we don't have data on data centers, ironically, but I would say if those were taken out, uh, new office construction would certainly be down very sharply. And even the renovation figures that are buried in here uh, may not look so strong. Manufacturing construction, 
down very sharply. I think some mint niches will be coming back or already have been food and beverage, medical equipment, uh, and so forth. But in general, manufacturing, I think, will continue to be weak. Transportation is a mix of a lot of different types of facilities. I know in Kansas City, you're finally getting a spanking new right-sized airport. And so uh, you will be doing very well. And that's probably a reason that you've been setting records for employment. Uh, but overall, uh, transportation construction spending likely to tail off as some of those airport projects finish up and others are put on hold. And in particular, this uh, huge anomalous increase in mass transit will go down as current uh, tunneling and other long-lived projects finish up and uh, mass transit is going to be a hurting category for a long time. Now, healthcare is close to flat so far, small declines in hospital and medical building, uh, small increase in special care, and then lodging, as Michelle mentioned, down very sharply. Her figures quite properly take in the first 10 months of the year compared to the first 10 months of last year. This is just uh, a single period from the peak month of February to October. But nevertheless, I think our trends are pretty consistent with what she showed. Well, here's uh, another data series that I pay a lot of attention to. This is the producer price indexes for construction inputs and then for what contractors say they would charge to put up new buildings, what I call a bid price index. And the PPIs for inputs to construction have been rising very steeply since May, up more than 1% a month for non-residential and up 2% a month for residential construction. Part of this was driven by extreme price increases for lumber and wood products that are now scaling back. But nevertheless, I think uh, we're continuing to see a squeeze on contractors whose own bid prices have been flat for the last six months. To summarize, year to date, we had this huge drop in construction employment in just two months, over a million jobs went away. Uh, 70 or uh, more than 70% of those have come back uh, in the last six months. And uh, on the residential side, uh, pretty much all of them have come back. On the non-residential side, uh, it, it's a, a little better than it is for the overall economy. But that uh, rebound in non-residential essentially happened in the first two months and then flattened out. PPP loans undoubtedly helped firms bring workers back, but now that money is running out. And as we face growing numbers of project cancellations and postponements, I'm afraid layoffs are going to pick up again. Let's see what's going to happen to the economy once we do start getting that vaccine into people's arms. It's still going to take a long time before people go back to work, shopping, entertainment, and travel, uh, or to universities. And uh, even then, owners, uh, whether they're uh, businesses building for their own account, investors or lenders, institutions or public agencies, there will be quite a lag before they feel the need or have the revenue to put up additional facilities. The best prospects on the private side are remodeling of many types of structures, local so-called last mile or last hour distribution centers, and data centers. On the public side, as I mentioned, K through through 12 schools look like a good bet. And if Congress comes through with some additional funding for highways, that's also gonna do better. But uh, until we get a really large stimulus bill or uh, backfilling of lost state and local tax revenues, I don't expect much other public construction. For the longer term, uh, post pandemic, I think we can see a couple of trends in place already. Population growth has been slowing down for more than a decade, and slower population growth means less demand growth for most types of construction, certainly for housing, but for related infrastructure, retail, and also slower growth of state and particularly local revenues. The shift from retail to e-commerce that started before the pandemic and greatly accelerated this year, and Michelle showed you a slide on the percentage of uh, sales that are through e-commerce going up so steeply 
Uh, that has implications for not just the number of stores, but also the number and type of distribution structures. As the uh, distribution firms go more and more to uh, drones, to robots, and uh, to automation both within and for receipt and uh, shipment out of structures, I think the footprints will shrink, but the buildings will get taller. Mm -hmm. Healthcare facilities, we've seen people shunning or kept out of hospitals, uh, people trying not to go into nursing homes, and yet we have a growing population and older age categories uh, who will need some kind of care. They can't all uh, stay at home indefinitely. And we'll also have more people with chronic conditions, I'm afraid, lingering symptoms from coronavirus, for instance. So uh, we've seen more trend toward telemedicine, but we will need new specialized facilities of different types. In terms of commercial facilities, I think people will flock back to restaurants when they feel it's safe to do so, but they're not gonna go into stores nearly as much as they did in the past. And hotels and travel related construction will uh, lag even more. Uh, the big question mark is what type of offices and how many people will be in them. Let me close by showing you um, the map of population change. Uh, it looks like we won't get 2020 final census figures until sometime next year. Uh, just yesterday, we heard that there were many serious problems with the data collection and analysis and indefinite delay on when those 2020 estimates will be in place. But at any rate, this map's colors are similar to what we've seen for several years. 10 states lost population last year. They're the ones in deep red. All of the states in pink, including in your territory, had very slow population growth, less than half a percent. And population growth was concentrated in the Southeast, Texas, Colorado, and Washington state, and particularly those Rocky Mountain states. And uh, I do think that these trends are likely to continue for a while. So with that, let me stop and uh, invite you to go to agc.org slash coronavirus to see our survey results, our best practices, the latest on government guidance. And also you can email me anytime, get onto the data digest email list. That's my weekly one page summary of economic news relevant to construction or send me any questions or data requests you have. And uh, let me stop uh, the sharing there and we'll go on to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Michelle. Um, that is all amazing, fascinating information and really sheds a light on um, what is happening. We appreciate you both kind of putting our region into your numbers and showing how that happens here. So um, I'll open this to any questions. If you wanna use the question and answer or chat on the, um, of this, we have a couple of minutes that we can uh, address some questions if there are any. Um, I know that, you know, I think the biggest question we all have is kind of looking forward and what those indexes are and, and how that looks. You've both addressed that to, to an extent. I think some of it is we just don't know. I think that's part of the biggest issue with the coronavirus has been some of the uncertainty. We were having a conversation yesterday about how uh, our AI Kansas City board was thinking that this would last three months and we'd all be back to seeing each other mid, mid to late summer and here it is December already. So, or, or as I like to call it, the 490th day of two, 2020. It seems to be going on forever. Well, Ryan, I have a question for you. Are, yeah. are, are you seeing new types of healthcare facilities uh, being uh, sought or designed uh, maybe a little early for building them? That was one of the questions that uh, I, I, I wrote down also was how is this affecting healthcare facilities and that idea of more, you know, we are seeing, at least I feel like we're seeing more specialized privately owned surgery centers and things like that much more. Obviously, there's the trend of um, uh, urgent care and smaller facilities rather than larger hospitals, although we do have a couple of large hospitals. Children's Mercy has just finishing up a, a very large uh, expansion here in town. Um, but I do see, I feel like we're seeing, and my assumption was, if we can ask you the same question, is the trend going to more privately owned surgery type facilities, things like that, where it's uh, much more specialized focused 
and much less, I guess, really the, the idea of fewer people and fewer interactions being more common than a large hospital or something like that. Well, I, I think so, but I think this is one of many ways in which the economy, unfortunately, is bifurcating and getting less equal. People have talked about the K-shaped uh, recovery, meaning uh, people who uh, have office-based jobs, they generally were able to move out of offices but keep working. People who uh, depended on folks who were in the office coming out for lunch or uh, to the uh, dry cleaner or other kinds of things, those kinds of businesses have been devastated. Businesses that depend on travel also uh, really hit hard. And uh, then other essential businesses have been hit by wave after wave of COVID, meatpacking plants most of all. And so um, those things have, have really made a difference in people's income and wealth levels. And that will extend over to healthcare too. There are gonna be a lot of people who are gonna be even more dependent on subsidized care, uh, uncompensated care from hospitals and so forth. But the people who uh, are able to avoid hospitals, they will be looking for those specialized facilities and private care more and more. Yeah, I think we're seeing um, more in that kind of smaller light commercial, well, I guess not commercial, but sort of the smaller buildings than we are seeing um, big hospital projects at this point. Mm -hmm. I also think the, inner, the, the housing thing is portion of this is interesting, multifamily versus single family. Obviously that, that, that fact that that spending is going up and that that is doing well, to me indicates that people believe I can work from home, maybe I want to have a better home situation to work from home, but I still feel secure enough in jobs and work to put money into housing, um, which is a, I think a positive sign of kind of how things shift. Do you see multifamily versus single family? Um, you know, Michelle, do you guys have indexes of kind of how those two relate to one another? So there are two different vehicles for us. We use our quarterly home design trends survey, which is um, a survey panel of custom residential architects. Um, and then the ABI has a, uh, their, the, our, our main indicator has um, a multi residential in it. So we, we it's, and it's a monthly and it sort of bears out a little bit differently. Um, but I agree with Ken. I, I think it's, it's um, there's some, design contracts have been pretty strong this year, but I do think we're going to see a slowdown um, in the first half of next year. Um, but I think single family is going to stay strong, right? Um, every story we're hearing is that there's huge backlogs. Um, there's been a little bit of a build off of a little bit of stabilization and backlogs in non-residential firms, but um, and in more so in multifamily, but the single family housing markets, we're hearing left and right that our residential architects are like six, they can't even take a new client for six months. So I do think this is that tale of two stories where you, the more affluent parts of this nation are able to afford and invest in their homes. And, um, you know, those that are on, um, uh, other side of the table. That being said, we have a housing issue in the United States. Um, yeah. Affordable housing is an issue. Homelessness is increasing in certain urban areas. Um, there's some very interesting proposals with hotels um, and, and contracts taking place in Los Angeles in particular, um, but also where you put children in social services, right, that are removed from the home. There's a lot of cities are looking, are using currently these empty hotel spaces to serve that function. So we are seeing a lot of weakening in, or it's revealed a lot of um, basically institutionalized challenges we have in this nation. And the single mothers being hit, women leaving the workforce more than men, um, the way that we've relied on schools to provide childcare. Um, and, and then again, the, 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 the ability to house our nation. So um, food distribution centers being another one. Um, so, so these are, uh, you know, issues that are going to face that that have come to light in, in light of the pandemic. Um, and they're going to continue to be things that we need to grapple with. And of course, the impact on the, the res in, in on the, the architect and, and contractor side. So um, kind of Ken, I know. <laughs> so there's opportunity in that. Um, 
as well. So I know that wasn't exactly what you asked Ryan about the kind of bifurcation of housing, but yeah, so I think there's a real need. I just, I think um, some of it relies on the public funds though to, to, in, in the tax base. And right now schools are in a better, better position. Ken, one more question. The, you hit upon workforce. I mean, I know that's something we talk about a lot here in both builders and AI Kansas City as far as that workforce that is out there and that will be here in the future and how it will affect our profession. You show that, you know, it's a huge loss and it's come back up, I think you said about 70 to 80 percent. Do you see that continuing up? How do you see just the overall imp the overall issue we have of workforce development right now um, with tied to coming out of the pandemic and what the future looks like? It's a continuing challenge, and I, I go back to the previous recession. Construction employment dropped for five years, much longer than the overall economy lost jobs, and a much deeper loss. It was 2.2 million jobs went away. That was 30% of the 2006 peak. And then construction started to recover slowly, uh, particularly on the residential side. By February of this year, we were back almost to that peak, whereas the overall economy had been setting records every month for several years. So construction has lagged, and that's made it harder to get workers back when the rest of the economy was uh, much more vibrant in creating job openings. Uh, the other challenge is actually decades old of parents and guidance counselors and school systems all de-emphasizing uh, work with your hands and instead saying work in an office if you want to get ahead. Um, so for the moment, construction firms that do have projects may find it easier to fill those places because construction employment overall is down by so much. But uh, that relief will be very temporary that we have both the, the medium term problem, shall I say, of um, getting enough workers in the right place for the amount of work that's there, but the uh, long-term secular problem of people not valuing construction as a career as much as they should. Right. I know that's a big thing for both the builders and AI Kansas City is uh, workforce development, feeding the pipeline, how we get more people both in the architecture profession and the construction industry. So. And we didn't talk about it, but immigration is a key part of that too, Ken. And we didn't really touch on that too much. Yes. We have a different we have a different problem in the architects. We rely on non-national students, right? Um, and that being such a big part of the, edu the the people going through schools that visas and things are an issue. But I know that's a way big, big impact on, on you all. So it's it's that because it's not appealing here, um, we've relied on, on outside labor. That's a good point. Well, thank you guys so much. We are, uh, we're a little bit past 11 o'clock, so. Thank you both for your time and for putting together this valuable information. This is um, exactly what we were hoping for when we started planning this about six months ago. So we hope to be able to follow up with some additional information next year. Um, we want to continue our AEC Insights program and address issues that are important to both uh, the architecture profession, construction industry, and engineering. So uh, if you have any thoughts or anything on that, please feel free to reach out to myself, Don Greenwell, or Don Taylor. Uh, thank you all again and have a very happy holiday. Bye.